On the issue of virtual hearings or remote hearings, we have Professor Manuel Gomez, who is a professor of law and associate dean at the Florida International University College of Law. He's the editor-in-chief of the World Arbitration Mediation Review, a board member of the Miami International Arbitration Society, and lead of the Latin American and Caribbean group of the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. Manuel is also an ardent supporter of this mood. Uh, you see him in Hong Kong and Vienna. And uh, Manuel, the floor is yours. And I hope the connection is better. Thank you. We'll see. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, and you see me virtually too, so you can't get a whole. You you can't get rid of me. Um. So obviously, I I want also to thank the the, the organizers. Uh, my dear friend Claudio Camila, who's who's up, who's always up for 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 all these challenges, and it's great to see uh, old friends, uh, Petra obviously, and and Stefan, and new friends, uh, Daniel and Federico. Uh, Stefan, you and your colleagues for keeping the mood alive, and obviously all the participants in in the mood. And uh, on that note, this year has brought it's really the tester, and 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 the mood has been a phenomenal uh, test. For for what it means to use technology uh, in the in the preceding years to to COVID nineteen, there were a, a lot of talks about technology and uh, and obviously the proponents of technology they all thought you know this is overdue we are ready for a virtual life the technology is there all the vendors you know we knew of Zoom uh, obviously and and uh, and some of the competitors. Uh, and we thought, you know, it's of course it's going to be, it's ready. You know, we fantasize about that, but when reality hit us, uh, we realized that that it's a it's a whole different story when you when you have that reality. Uh, on the note that on the on the topic that 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 is is the the subject of my presentation, the World Bank and other multinational uh, multilateral organizations have been investing in access to justice initiatives for a long time. Uh, uh, the European Union has advanced all these uh, phenomenal uh, projects on access to justice broadly. Uh, obviously, arbitration or commercial arbitration is not first in line uh, to, to as a candidate for a discussion on access to justice, but as arbitration become a more subject of normative regulation, as arbitration intersects more with uh, with the administration of justice and and naturally we have those points of contact between the arbitral process and courts when courts are called to assist the arbitral proceedings we have there a, a, it, it comes up the idea of, of access to justice the right to be heard and so on and so forth obviously at the end of the arbitral proceedings when the discussion of whether to to set aside or later on to refuse the recognition and enforcement of an award and could be achieved on the basis of a violation of fundamental rights. And almost every uh, constitution or legal system in the world, regardless of level of development of that nation, has something on access to justice, on the right to be heard, on due process. So for, for this specific topic in the context of international commercial arbitration, and let me just add that in, in international commercial arbitration is really the catalyzer, or it's really the 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 the, the medium that allows a, number one to test whether those concepts are practicable, and two, how do how to uh, uh, how to make those concepts a reality? How the 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 concept of delivering justice in an efficient way and in a fair manner. It can be can be a reality. So um, I want I have I have a, a few very specific points surrounding the idea the the when and how should virtual hearings be ordered by an arbitral tribunal, which is the the specific question that I was asked to cover. And uh, and let me just preface that with a um, reference to to three. Uh, normative sources from the model law. I will only refer to the model law and then perhaps give uh, a couple of examples from, from legislation. And the, the relevant provisions of the model law that we look at uh, when we 
try to answer those two questions, the when and how, are naturally Article 18 of the model law that says the party shall be treated with equality and each party shall be given a full opportunity of present in its case. Uh, different uh, uh, countries that adopt the model law, some adopt the Article 18 verbatim, some have not adopted Article 18. Venezuela, for example, is a country that has has said, if you, if you read the law, it says, this is a model law jurisdiction, but there's no Article 18. And why? Because that country doesn't believe in Article 18? No, because that country in the constitution has a provision that says the party should be treated with equality and each party should be given a full opportunity of presenting their case. And there is also a constitutional provision there that says every mechanism for dispute resolution is deemed to be part of the administration of justice uh, complex. So, so that would be one indirect way to get to arbitration in a, in a jurisdiction that doesn't specifically have an Article 18-like provision in the commercial arbitration statute. Then the next provision is Article 19, 19 uh, of the model law, uh, 19.1 that speaks to, you know, basically subject to the provisions of this law, the parties are free to agree on the procedure to be followed by the arbitral tribunal. 19.2 gives the arbit arbitral tribunal the authority or power to conduct the arbitration in, in, in any manner, in such manner as it considers it appropriate. There is a, then lastly another provision, Article 24, that uh, covers specifically uh, hearing and, and written proceedings. So moving on, uh, I just wanted to, to go over four minor points, and I'll do it uh, within, within a minute each, uh, Stefan, so, so we can move on. So the first question, and, and those are basically, what are the four questions that arise when you're analyzing a case uh, and you're trying to figure out when and, and how should an arbitral hearing or be ordered by an arbitral tribunal? So the first question is, has to do with whether there is a right to a hearing. Uh, and that, that necessitates that you take a look at the party autonomy. You know, party autonomy is a big elephant in the room here. Uh, we know that party autonomy is the pillar of arbitration. Arbitration would not exist if there were no party autonomy. First of all, to enter into an arbitration agreement. So, but the question here is a finer question. Is, is there a right to a hearing? It's not that if the parties have have autonomy, obviously the parties have autonomy. But the question is, do the parties do, do the parties have a right to a hearing? And you can do the finer question: Do the parties have a right to an oral hearing? And you could do the finer question: Do the parties have a right to an oral hearing in person? So all those layers, you get the picture because you had to read a problem uh, that dealt with it. Uh, somebody's not hearing me. We're hearing you quite okay. well. I saw yeah. I saw a comment that somebody wasn't hearing. So anyway, so the right, you know, the the basically just to move on to the next the next one, uh, the party the the right to a hearing is you can get finer and finer as if you're peeling an onion. So your study, your analysis has to peel the onion. The right is very big. So right to a hearing, right to an oral hearing, right to an oral hearing in person. So uh, is it expressly provided for arbitration in the law of the jurisdiction? Is it expressly provided for litigation and implicitly provided for arbitration? That would be a second possibility. Is it not provided at all? So the, 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 the country doesn't say anything. The arbitration statute doesn't say anything. Litigation, uh, the, civil, the code of civil procedure doesn't say anything. In, in, a, in a jurisdiction, it might be even prohibited uh, I haven't found that example, but it might be the case. Um, or that the party said, no, no to any hearing. We don't want to see each other. Never, ever. We just want to do it through document. Then the second issue is whether the tribunal has an authority. We know that 19 uh, gives a, 19.2 gives a tribunal authority, a 24 model law. Uh, these numbers are all articles of the model law. Um, so, so, then the question is, how far can the tribunal go? Are there, and, and, and there we have two limits. 
Limit number one, the mandatory provisions regarding, let's take that onion again, the right to a hearing, the right to an oral hearing, the right to an, the right to an oral physical hearing. So depending on how it is in your jurisdiction, how, how, how high the bar is for, um, for, for determining that this is fun, fundamental to the rights of the party in an arbitration proceeding, you would, you would uh, be able to assert this is a mandatory provision that the arbitral tribunal should follow or the parties should follow. So what are the, about the parties, the, 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 the second boundary that the tribunal has is the agreement of the parties on the country, going back to, to autonomy, right? So Article 24, one of the model law um, starts off by saying, subject to any contrary agreement by the parties, you get the picture. So 24, one, would say the tribunal may, but subject to a contrary agreement by the parties. 19.2, which is the, the, the superpowers to the tribunal to lead the proceedings, starts with failing such agreement. So the model law recognizes the authority of the tribunal, but even more importantly, recognizes that this authority stems from the parties. So the question that arises there is what if the parties are irrational and the parties impose on the tribunal something that is counter to the tribunal's uh, sense of whether there is a fair proceeding, whether there is a right to it, the, an obligation to the parties to, to give the parties an, a, an equal opportunity to present their case and so on and so forth. Um, then the, the, the next item, actually I'm gonna conflate three and four, uh, and I'm gonna end with this, has to do with how important is that right, which leads to a breach if the right is not upheld, and what's the effect of that breach? Is that breach sufficient to allow the losing party to set aside the award based on public policy, due process? What could it be? You would have to look at the actual uh, law that it's relevant for the parties to, to to analyze the the you know the setting aside of the award. Uh, then another question that is very very important that has to do with waiver to that uh, challenge is when shall the party raise the breach? Shall the party raise the breach as soon as the party realizes that there is a breach to the right to an oral hearing in person? Uh, and if they don't, do they waive it? There are jurisdictions that consider that that's a waiver. They said, did you find out that the arbitrators were being arbitrary arbitrary, uh, or being going against your own rules, but you convalidated it because you didn't say anything. You connected on Zoom. We have proof that you were connected there. Well, but we couldn't hear, but you never raised it. And then finally, and this is finally, finally, then at the recognition and enforcement, stage, uh, there are, you know, the New York Convention, Article 5, uh, you could go three routes. Article 5.1b was the right of the party to present their case, the, what, uh, what we could use to request the enforcing court refuse the recognition enforcement of this award because the violation of that led to, uh, uh, and it affected the party, the right of the party to present the case. Article 5.1.D, irregularity of the proceedings. Article 5.2.B, public policy of the country where enforcement is sought. And just to end, uh, Article 5.2.B, the public policy, sometimes is raised together with 5.1.B. Sometimes a party that is challenged, that is, that is seeking to the, for the enforcing court to refuse a recognition enforcement on the basis of a, a breach to the party's right to present their case, that sometimes or oftentimes that also uh, infringes upon uh, the public policy of the country, even more so considering, as I said earlier, that most countries around the world have a high, high regard for due process and uh, the right to present one, one's case is usually deemed of public policy. I'll stop here.
Thank you very much.